Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same thing to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches <laughs> to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other ten tenants who will give him the fruits of their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the corner, cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush it. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held, because they held him to be a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but I love grapes. I really do. I think they're one of the best fruit, you know, you don't have to prepare them that much. Pop them in the fridge, pop them in your mouth, right? But I, every now and then I'm, I get reluctant to buy them because when I go to HEB and I see these bags of grapes there, all, the top ones are always picked off. So what I'm thinking is happening is shoppers go to the, to the store and they munch on grapes. They do. I saw one lady go to every different kind of grape on the rack there and pop them in her mouth and I thought that's what those are for I, didn't, I thought they were you're supposed to buy them by the bag and weigh them and no they do they weigh them well I think they do because I remember one time I went in it was 349 I grabbed a bag and it said that'll be 17 dollars <laughs> oh wow <laughs> I thought it was 349 but but whenever I tried to buy this house you know, on the lake I discovered it had a trellis of grapes in the backyard that was well developed and there were grapes hanging everywhere. I was gonna buy the house for the grapes. That's how much I like grapes. It also had an observatory in the backyard and I like stargazing too. It had a train, a model train station in the attic. I like that too. The guy that owned it was 95 and he'd built that train station for years. And I was gonna buy the house it had, it had 12 palm trees in the yard. It had waterfront. That's why I really wanted to buy it. And so I thought I'd buy it, you know. But then reality hit. I overbid. <laughs> and when you bid more than what a house is worth, then, then the bank comes back and says it's not worth that. Because I thought it was worth more because of the observatory and the grape trellis and the palm trees. Well, somebody else bought it. Two months later when I drove by, the grape trellis was gone, the observatory was gone, and all the trees were cut down at the root. They cut all of those beautiful palm trees. And I realized what was beauty for me and what's, what, what made the house desirable for me might be an obstacle to somebody else. They might not, might not like it at all, but 
I did discover that, that it's possible to totally waste a beautiful vineyard. And here's what happened in this story. They were wasting the vineyard in a sense. They, a vineyard owner planted it, put a fence around it, a wine press in it. You know, that's where they stomped the grapes. You know. Now, I saw a video the other day about watermelon wine, and they showed women stomping watermelon. Does that happen too? Or I don't think so. That, that's not how you make watermelon wine. But when the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants. That's the prophets. This is, a, this is an allegory. It's a parable. He sent the prophets. And they came, basically, and they took the, his prophets and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. So even though it's a parable about a vineyard and the owner and his servants, Jesus is talking about God and the vineyard is Israel. And, of course, the, the ones who were killing the prophets was the people he was speaking to. So when they finally perceived that the story had a little barb to it, they weren't happy. They wanted to stone him too. You see, back then, the penalty for being a false prophet was to be stoned. Now, how did they do that? Well, they took you to a high cliff threw you off of it, if that didn't kill you, the rocks that were coming down afterwards would. And I don't know if you've ever been to Israel. There's rocks everywhere. And by the way, we should be in prayer for Israel this week. They're going through some tremendous assaults, but everything was prophesied in Scripture, and we're seeing Scripture being fulfilled in our very eyes today. If you didn't believe the Bible, you need to pick up your Bible now and read about end times. Read about wars, earthquakes, what happened in last, last night in Afghanistan, earthquake. What, what happened in Israel, war. <laughs> What's happening in Hawaii, fires, volcanic eruptions. Although, I had to question someone's sanity for buying a vacation home on top of a volcano. That's what Florida, you know, that's what really Hawaii is. Hawaii is a, it's just a, a series of volcanoes. And so when they had that fire that everybody thinks was maybe started illegitimately, I don't know how the fire started, but I can tell you this. There were 80 mile an hour winds coming down from a mountain that's 8,000 feet high. Now, those winds, and I, I heard several eyewitnesses say it was the highest winds they've ever seen in Hawaii in Maui. And what happened was you had a hurricane exactly 400 miles off the coast that was spinning this way. And you had a front that was causing the another storm causing the air to come down at 80 miles an hour. And you had this storm out here spinning the winds. And it increased the velocity of those 80 mile an hour winds coming down and created a firestorm. Sort of like being with billows working iron. I don't know if you've known that. Everybody's saying, well, how did it melt aluminum? I worked with steel. I, 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 I actually took two courses in welding and sheet metal and was certified as a welder and a sheet metal worker because my dad thought I should have a backup trade. He was a pastor, too, and he had a backup trade. He was a boiler maker. So he trained me. My dad was a professor, actually, of the welding school. I call him professor. He was the teacher, the, ma the master welder at Shreveport Bossier Votech Center where I went to learn welding every summer of high school. And he made me learn uphill, downhill, overhead was hot, tough. Any welders out there? Is overhead hard? You better know where the slag's coming when it comes down. That's why I didn't like it. If you had you know, your leather jacket on, that, that slag comes down and gets down in your collar, it hurts a lot. But anyway, being a metal worker, I also realized that there's, there's ways to, to, to do the job properly. Uh, notice this. It, it says here that when it came time for fruit, did you know there's a fruit time and harvest in every situation of life? There's fruit time and harvest. Uh, Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. He said, if we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the Spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. And we are sowing in our lives by every deed that we do. And here, 
Jesus is talking about being fruitful, and he's talking about producing results, really, and listening to the prophets, the servants. And back then, I'm glad I wasn't a preacher then, because if they didn't like your message, they just stoned you. And they killed honest prophets. The Old Testament is a history of killing righteous men. And it didn't stop there. What about John the Baptist? Was he a prophet in the spirit of Elijah? Yes. What'd they do to him? Off with his head. And so Jesus was talking about killing people that God had sent to them for their benefit. And they murdered them. And this is all true. It seems to me that just as we have today a situation where people who are illegitimate gain power and will not release it, and they keep the rest of us in servitude, and that's what's happening in the world today, all across the world. It's called globalism. They've gained power, and they're keeping the rest of us as serfs, and they're, they're punishing us by using the very money we contribute through taxes against us, the, the church was doing the same thing. The very messengers God sent, they killed. And now, as a last ditch effort, God sends his son to get their attention. And Jesus knew they were gonna kill him too. Now no, notice how bold he is to tell this story. Jesus never backed down from voicing his opinion about current politics. He did it all the time. Did you know that that's what made Martin Luther famous, was speaking out against corruption? And yet I, have people, I hear people today say, be careful, Pastor, you don't want to go there. Don't talk about politics. And yet it's politics that's killing our world today. It's the silence of the church that's caused this to happen. We would have never lost a third of our membership across this land had we not been gullible and, and had we not been blind to the, to the obvious, obvious goals behind what's really happening. And we, we've just been blind to it. And, and so we say, well, pastor, churches are to be kind and loving and we're to, we're to speak love and peace and never judge anyone and don't ever speak out against sin that that might just cause somebody to get upset you might get stoned and in truth what we've done is we've we've surrendered the message of the gospel of jesus christ which says lay down your sins repent live for god and replaced it with a gospel of hedonism which says whatever feels good do it let's celebrate our sin instead of repenting of it that's what's wrong with the church today across the land I don't care what denomination it is they're all struggling with the issues that our leadership has brought upon us and they're killing the church they're stoning the prophets again interestingly enough last Last night, or well, yesterday, I was listening to an attorney, Jay Sekulow, who's really good, and he said this. He, he started some, some uh, really good organizations, but he said this about what's really going on. He said that we, we don't realize it, but there, there's a FBI and CIA terrorist watch list, and it was set up after 9-11 and they allow because of the rules that were implemented after 9-11 which rumor has it CIA might have been involved in but after that happened that's rumor by the way don't this is parable don't take it seriously what happened after that was uh, they, they they have blamed certain people for the, the trouble in America and so the here are the the watchwords these, this is a fact. There are documents upon documents to verify this. If you speak these words on Facebook, you're a target. These are the words. Now, I want you to listen carefully. 
These are the words at the top of the list. It's not jihad. It's not ISIS. It's this. Word of God. Scripture. These are the terrorist watchwords. Listen carefully. Word of God. Scripture. Prayer. Follow the rule of law. Now, wouldn't you say that all, the, all those are good attributes? Shouldn't we follow the rule of law, the Ten Commandments? Shouldn't we be a praying people? Shouldn't we read the scripture? Why are they terrorist watchwords? I'll let you decide the answer to that question. But let me ask you this. Are they still killing the prophets? Are they still denying God's call to repentance? Are they still denying holiness as the, the standard? Or are they lifting up wickedness as the standard? Have we changed the message? Or is the church preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that he preached? Again, I'll let you determine the answer to those questions. Because that's just a parable. I'm just speaking in terms that Jesus would have used. Now think about this. The vineyard was Israel. The father was the vineyard owner. The church, the leaders of the church, were the ones who could either accept or reject the message, and they in turn were the ones who killed the prophets and then tried and did kill him too. Is that the way the story ended? It's not a rhetorical question. It is the way the story ended, right? Killed, they killed Christ. But no, not really, because you see, they didn't know that he was going to come out of the grave. You can't kill eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. You can't kill life. You can't kill love. You can't kill light. Especially if you're trying to do it from darkness. Because God is light, and in him is no darkness. And the prince of darkness is raging his war against the kingdom of light. And the best part of this scripture that I found is where it's talking about what we're going to do. Where's, where's my scripture at? I have my book, and I put it down. Right here, it says this. That... They said this, when they saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come let us kill him and have his inheritance. But did you know that they got it all wrong? Because it's by submitting to him that we obtain his inheritance. What is the inheritance? To be the sons of light. To live forever in a place called heaven. That's your inheritance. And by submitting to his righteousness, we become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And all that he has becomes ours. And we are sons of God, and Jesus Christ is our brother. We are in the family of God. Joint, everybody say joint heirs. Now, anybody here ever settle a will? Well, what if, what if there's two people, let's say two kids, and they're joint heirs? What does that usually mean? Co-equal. Right. They would get a, basically a division, a 50-50 split. That's not how it always works out. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you really want to see trouble, just have a death in the family and watch the, watch the fur fly, right? Because we're all about things, and we should be about other things. So how can we submit to the message of God and end up not rejecting it because we're biting the hand that feeds us when we reject the message. I encourage you to do this. Read the Bible for yourself. Pick it up. In it, you'll find eternal life. Study it. Check it out. Search the scriptures, Jesus said, because in them you find eternal life. Spend more time in the Bible than you spend watching CNN. Or Fox. Some of you, I saw a couple of faces go, CNN, I would never watch that. 
I love that face. But yeah, Fox, what Newsmax, spend as much time in the Bible as you're spending listening to the bad news. Spend more time with the good news. And what you'll discover is your attitude will elevate. And you'll not be depressed, but filled with joy because you are joint heirs with the living God. And Jesus Christ is our great high priest. And we need no one else. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.